Welcome to the Let Good Things In Show. I'm your host, Amanda Acker. I'm so happy you're here. At the Let Good Things In Show, we talk all about second chances, resiliency, following your intuition, and even music. Listen to hear stories of hope and to be inspired. Remember, you are stronger than you think. Let's dive in. Hi, my amazing humans. Thank you so much for tuning in today. On last week's episode, I told the story of what led to my arrest. And on today's episode, I'm going to go through part of my journey um, being incarcerated. If you listened last week, you will know that I was arrested at gunpoint on a very busy street and decided that it was a good idea to tell the cops everything that had happened in, in reference to the robbery that was just committed. They told me that I would get out of jail and that I did the right thing. Yes, telling the truth is always the right thing. But as I learned quite quickly, well, sort of quickly, while being incarcerated, that my truth-telling was not the best idea at that point in this journey. So being arrested, I remember that after I was at the police station for quite some time and wrote my written statement and did all those things, that they put us all into a vehicle, I think it was a van, and took us to the county jail. I remember thinking the whole time in that, on our journey to the jail, that I'm getting out. I did the right thing. I'm not going to see jail and I'm going to pick up my son tonight like I was supposed to. And maybe no one even needs to know that this happened. This was just a hiccup in my life and, you know, I'll be okay. As we pulled into the jail, we all were carted off and put in this, it was, I guess it was the basement, but we were put in here and I remember having to put my hands on the wall and I was padded down. All of my belongings were taken from me, my cell phone, my purse, my any jewelry I would happen to have on. It was all taken from me. And I remember that feeling of overwhelming anxiety because I didn't know what was on the other side of those doors. And from my understanding, I wasn't even going to be here. So not only was I having the anxious feelings of, I don't know what's going to happen next, I was also feeling like, why am I even here? Like I thought, I thought I was not going to come here. So it was a little confusing for me at that point. You know, and when you go into jail, it's like you're leaving your whole life behind because you can no longer just pick up your phone and call a friend and say, hey, I need help. I'm in a bad situation. You're in there and no one in your outside world knows that you're in there. And you're treated very forcefully and as if you're not human anymore, as if you've No matter what crime you're being charged with, you are treated as if you are like this horrible person. You're forced to do things. You know, you get your fingerprints, they smash your finger on the machine to do so. And then you're thrown into this cell or room or whatever you want to call it. And you look around and you just don't know, like, how is a human expected to sit in this? The floor is sticky. The, the benches that you're given, mind you, it's, you know, it's getting later in the day and I'm tired and I would love to lay down and, you know, relax. But you can't because the cell is all metal benches. And my goodness, you know, if you had to pee, you know, you, there's a toilet in there, but it's fully exposed. It looks like it hadn't been cleaned in ages. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't even allow an animal to be in a cage like this. And you're just thrown in there and nobody tells you what's going to happen next. (laughs) Imagine going into something that scares the living shit out of you and being thrown into this room that's disgusting and makes your skin crawl and not being told when you'll get out of there, what will happen next. You literally are just sitting there like an animal. So time goes on and eventually we're given food. Still, we don't know what exactly is going to happen next. And hours and hours and hours go by. And and sometimes you get moved to a different cell, same scenario with different people. It's like you're waiting in this line that you don't know where it leads to. You have I had no idea what was going to happen once I made it to the top of this line I was in, I guess. And so they say, okay, we're going to give you food or whatever. I don't, I doubt that's what they said, but you're handed this brown paper bag. And to this day, I do not allow small brown bags into my home. It, the, these paper bags and you open them up and it's this bread with one slice of bologna in it. 
and I do not like bologna, (laughs) and stale cookies, and I think you got some sort of drink. And I remember thinking, I don't want to eat this. Is there something else? But no, like this is what you're given, and that is what you have to eat. So guess what? I ate those bologna sandwiches. I stomached that flavor that I hate so much because I had to survive. And time goes on, and we're just, you know, me, my friend was actually with me the whole time, the one that I got arrested with, obviously. So, you know, we were getting along still, and like, we're like, oh gosh, I can't wait for this to be over. Like, the waiting is killing us. I think I probably waited for eight hours, nine hours. I don't even know. It was a crazy long time, and, and no one is willing to help you. It's not like the guards came in and sat down with us and explained to us the next step. No one said to us, you're going to be okay, but this is what's going to happen. This is what you can expect. There was no tour, so to speak. There was no guide to answer questions, not to mention the other people who were in there with you, these people who were also going through one of the scariest moments of their lives, or they were people who have been there many times. And would kind of give you some insight, but of course, they had their own agenda. They weren't there to guide the sad, scared girls their first time being arrested. And it was very intimidating because some of these women were women that if I saw on the street, I would run away from. And now I'm in the same room as them. So it made me reflect on me too. Like, wow, I'm in here with these women who I would have judged otherwise. But guess what? I'm just like them. I made a bad choice that landed me here just like they did because all I was doing was trying to survive. And that's what they were doing too. So who am I to judge, right? But back then, I don't think I had that clear of a thought. It was more along the lines of, oh my gosh, I need to get out of here. I'm scared. I don't know these women. You know, back then at the time, I was not even 100 pounds soaking wet. And I didn't come from, you know, the hood. Like I never went to the hood to get drugs. I I was never exposed to this life. So I was really fucking scared. Like I said before, in hindsight, it was a huge learning experience for me. Because I learned that, you know, no matter what we look like, We all have struggles, and no one deserves to be judged. We don't need to fear each other. We need to embrace each other. But after this long waiting, all of a sudden, I'm in a line where I'm standing up. I'm no longer in a cell. I'm in a normal stand-up line. Eventually, I find out that we are in line to go in front of the judge. I was like, the judge, okay, this is when I'm getting out. Cool. Like, this is the end. Finally, I survived that. I can get out of here. I remember walking into this room where the judge was, and it was almost like I had some form of arrogance about me because I was like, ha ha, I told the truth, and I'm getting out. I am so lucky. I did the right thing, and this is all just a bad memory. Well, guys, that is not what happened. I get told that I have a $10,000 straight bond. I'm charged with robbery with intent of bodily harm. Those aren't the exact words, but that is the charge. I'm also charged with promoting prostitution, and I'm charged with criminal conspiracy to commit robbery with the intent of severe bodily harm. And not only do I find this out, I'm also handed a discovery packet. And in there included my three-page three, four, five page, however long it was, written statement of what happened. And I wasn't just the one handed this written statement. My friend was handed this written statement, and so were the other three people who were involved. So now I'm locked up with people who know that I narked or told the truth. These were not things that I was told were going to happen. I was even more scared and ashamed of myself than I was sitting in those gross cells waiting to get to this point. I remember being in the last holding area, and it was like all these seats, and there was two pay phones. We'll call collect phones, I guess you would say, but they looked like normal pay phones. And there's all these women. There's women who are... Um, going through withdrawal symptoms of, from being on heroin. There's women 
who were prostituting themselves. There was women who were hanging on for dear life because they were homeless and did something so they could be warm and be fed. And there I was submerged with all of this along with my friend who now hates me, who now knows what I did. And I remember they tell us that we can use those phones to call to get bailed out. Remember, oh, great. I'm going to call my dad and he's going to bail me out. That's what I'm going to do because he'll want to know what happened. He'll care. This will be, ah, this goes back to the beginning of when all I wanted was his attention. And no, when I committed this crime, it was not for my dad's attention, but he's the first person I thought of. I was like, oh, I'm going to call my dad. I did, and I regretted it instantly. He did not embrace me. He did not ask me, oh my gosh, Mandy. That's, he's the only person on this earth allowed to call me Mandy. But he did not say, oh my gosh, Mandy, what happened? Are you okay? No. He said to me, you made your bed. Now you have to lay in it and hung up on me. You know, I get it now, but then again, I don't. Because no matter what, even though he wasn't going to bail me out, that was fine. And well, in that moment, it was not fine, obviously. But it was okay for him not to bail me out. That was his choice. But I still thought he should have asked me what happened. So eventually, I watch all three of the guys get bailed out. See you bye. See you bye. See you bye. And then my friend gets bailed out. I don't, though, because my mother didn't have money to bail me out. Yeah, I called her. I told her. She couldn't do anything about it. I was stuck there. And I thought I did everything right. I watched everyone else leave. I didn't get to leave that day. I had to experience the next step alone with these women who I had never met before in my life. So the next step was I had to get processed and sent into main population. And all main population is, is jail. It's being up with all the other women who are incarcerated who have already gone through this horrendous process that I had just gone through. And that's when it got really real. <laughs> I was stripped down and I had to do the, you know, the whole thing where you have to bend over and cough to make sure you're not smuggling drugs within yourself. I had to shower with someone watching me, even though I will say that shower, even though it was a shit shower, <laughs> it did make me feel better because at least I didn't smell like three-day-old B.O. And then I was given what I was supposed to wear, which was an orange jumpsuit. I think it was orange. It may have been red. I don't know. Trauma does that. Some of my memories are not fully clear. And they give you your bundle with like the blanket and whatever else. And then you take the walk up to main population. At this point, I was just anxious. It's like I have to I have to call somebody else. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I kept thinking, who can I call? It was this like insane obsession, right? Because I needed out. My fight or flight was at its highest I think I had ever felt. I needed out. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. But I did, obviously. I had no choice. And I get up there, and I don't, nothing bad happened. But I remember being so disappointed in myself. How could I have done this? Why did I make this choice? Why am I not holding my son right now? I was in there for a week before I got bailed out, thanks to my mom and an ex of mine who got the money together to get me out. But within that week, I learned that I can survive on my own, right? Because I did. In one of the worst places, I survived. I made it through that week, and now I was out. Yes. I'm free. My freedom is, you know, given back to me. And now I can go about my life. No one told me about the hell I would experience of not knowing what was going to happen to me next. It wasn't as if I got out and they said, okay, you're good. Well, you know, that's all. You're done. No, no, no. It was a process. And I didn't know whether or not I was going to go to prison 
stay longer in jail, get out, be on probation, have a record, not have a record. I had no idea. I was living in true limbo. Yeah, I was free, technically speaking, but I was not free. And those experiences that I went through, I I didn't get sentenced till about a year later. A lot of things happen in between that initial release and then getting sentenced. And I'm going to save those full details for this next episode. But what I want to tell you from the experience of, you know, going from arrest and then that experience through holding and then going up into main population is that I learned, like I said, while telling the story, I learned that we are all equal. We do things the only way we know how to survive. No one on this planet deserves to be judged for their choices. We are all humans and we all make mistakes. I learned that I can end up in really bad situations because of my choices. You see, it's not like my friend told me if I didn't do it, she was going to kill me. I had the choice. Nobody forced me to do that. The police didn't threaten anything, you know, my life if I didn't tell the truth. I chose to do those things out of fear. Number one, with my friend, it was fear of her not liking me anymore. It was that fear of losing that person who I spent so many years with, that fear of abandonment. I told the police everything because I was afraid if I didn't, I would lose everything. Not just my friend, but my child, my dignity, the little bit of self-worth I had left. But guess what? It got taken from me anyway because I didn't listen to myself. I didn't listen when my myself was telling me to run. Don't do this. No friendship, no person. Take the friendship part out of it. No person is worth risking my freedom. And when I told the truth to the cops, I truly thought I was doing the right thing. Maybe I was naive. Telling the truth is always right, but I should have waited, like I said in my episode last week. You know, I learned also that I am fucking strong. I never thought in a million years that me, Amanda, this person, this nerdy, left out of everything, bottom barrel person would ever see jail. Or if I did, survive it. And I did. I survived all of that. I survived being in holding and being treated like an animal, less than an animal. I survived my friend finding out in that scenario that I went behind her back and told the truth. I didn't die. No one attacked me. I survived. So my affirmations for you for this episode are very familiar to what I always say, but I just need to keep saying it. Tell yourself, when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, I am stronger than I think I am. I am stronger than I think I am. I have the power to get through the situations that hurt me. I have the power to get through the situations that hurt me. I am okay, just as I am. I am okay, just as I am. So with that, I want to leave you with a couple of other things. I want to leave you with the fact that we have the power within ourselves to make the right choices. We just really need to listen to ourselves, right? Starting today, listen to yourself. When you're in a situation you don't know what to do, you know what to do. You just need to listen. Also, I want to invite you to my Facebook group. Um, It is called the Let Good Things In Show. And in that group, I share the episodes And I also um, do some Facebook Lives in there and go deeper on certain subjects. It's a growing Facebook group right now, and I'm really excited to be able to invite you in there. So please search it, the Let Good Things In Show on Facebook, and join. And I will put the link in the show notes as well. I want you to know that I am here for you. And I'm so grateful for each of you for listening to my episodes each week. and. If you would like to, please leave a review of the show so that more people can find it. And for all of you listening out there, remember, you are stronger than you think, and you can have the life you imagine, regardless of your past. 
Make sure to hit subscribe or follow so you don't miss an episode of the show, and I will talk to you all soon.